Morning. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, and see the iPad screen as well. Yes. Yep. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so let us start a, a lesson today. So if you remember, we talked about the polar form of the complex numbers. And we also learned that if we want to multiply them or divide them, we don't need to switch back to the standard form and do it there. We can just use it, use the formulas that we discovered last time uh, to multiply them or divide them. But if I want to add them and subtract them, I have to do it in a normal way. So let me just refresh your memory a little bit. So if I have two complex numbers written in the polar form in this form, So R1 is the absolute value of Z1, theta1 is the argument of Z1, and Z2 is R2, cosine theta2 plus I sine theta2. Uh, we learn that if I want to multiply them, we can just simply multiply the absolute values yes and then uh, we add the arguments of course we were able to prove this so we did it once and then we saw that there is a nice pattern going on so let us use this pattern from now on and the rule for division was similar so here we need to divide r1 by r2 and this time I subtract the arguments okay so these are important formulas it's good to know when you're dealing with complex numbers okay now let us <clears throat> give very simple examples first so example uh, let <clears throat> sorry let z be equal to 3 times cosine pi over 3 plus i sine pi over 3 and w be this <clears throat> 2 times cosine pi over 6 plus i <clears throat> sine pi over 6 okay so determine uh, determine z times w and z divided by w uh, in a standard form okay Okay, so this is a very, very simple exercise. So we just want to uh, work with these formulas so that we can have them in our memory. So if you see, this is a complex number in the polar form. By the way, you need to be careful. If this is going to be in the polar form, this number should be a positive real number. And this angle should be an angle between 0 inclusive and 2 pi exclusive, okay? <clears throat> Of course, if I change this to 2 pi plus pi over 3 here and there, this is not wrong. This will represent the same number because cosine of 2 pi plus pi over 3 would be the same. Sine 2 pi plus pi over 3 would be the same as sine of pi over 3. So if you write it like this, it is not wrong. You will get the same number z, complex number. Uh, but that is not called the polar form. By the convention, when you talk about the polar form, you want you have to write the argument here. And we might have different conventions for the argument, but I told you that in this course, let us stick to this convention that the argument is on this in, in this interval. Okay, now let us solve the problem. So if I want to calculate z times w, according to the formula above, I just multiply the absolute values. So it becomes, let me just write it down. So 3 times 2, and then I add the arguments. So pi over 3 is the argument of the first one, pi over 6 is the argument of the second one. And then I will have right sine pi over 3 plus pi over 6. But because it is demanded to write it in a standard form, so apparently this can be simplified more. So it's 3 times 2 is 6, p 
pi over 3 is 60 degrees, pi over 6 is 30 degrees. If I add them together, it becomes 90 degrees. If I express it in radians, it becomes pi over 2. Of course, you can take the common denominator, you will get the same answer. Uh, pi over 2. Okay, and now you know that cosine of pi over 2 is 0, sine of pi over 2 is 1. So this becomes 6i, yes? So and it is in standard form. So for example, if I ask you what is the real part of this, you would say the real part is 0. I can give you the same question and ask you what is, for example, the imaginary part of this, you say that the imaginary part is 6. And if I want to do the same thing for division, this time I need to divide the absolute value of z by absolute value of w, and this time I subtract the angles, yes? So the angle corresponding to the 1 in the numerator, pi over 3, minus the angle corresponding to the 1 in the denominator. So this would be this expression. Yes, and then if I ask you what is pi over 3 minus pi over 6, you can take the common denominator, yes, and it becomes pi over 6. So this becomes 3 over 2 cosine pi over 6 plus i sine pi over 6. But because pi over 6 is one of the famous angles, we can continue exactly we can f go forward exactly, yes, so this becomes 3 over 2 cosine of pi over 6 is 1 no, it's a square root of 3 over 2, and then the sine is 1 over 2. And then finally, I multiply this 3 over 2 inside, so it becomes 3 square root of 3 divided by 4, and plus 3 over 4i. So that is the division of these two uh, complex numbers. Yes, any questions? Okay, so now let us uh, talk about this a very important theorem. We actually talked a little bit. Uh, we, uh, I tried to motivate you why that formula works, but let me now uh, uh, state it formally here. So that is called de Moivre's formula. So, yeah, that's a French uh, word. So this is the name of the guy who invented the formula de Moivre, de Moivre something like that, and then apostrophe s for possession theorem. Uh, okay, so what is the theorem stating? The theorem states that if n belongs to z, an integer, even negative integer, not no problem, and theta is a real number, not just the one which is between 0 and 2 pi. Theta is a number in R, whatever it is, it works. Then you have this very important formula, cosine theta plus i sine theta to that power n, it becomes cosine, so n times theta plus i sine n theta. So that is an extremely important formula called the de Moore's formula. Okay, it doesn't mean that the Newton's binomial theorem doesn't work. So this is a binomial, I want to raise it to power, for example, if I give you this to power 5, you can, what, you can use the binomial theorem, what you learned in Math 5, to expand that. But of course, it becomes tedious. If you know the formula, it, it contains 6 terms. If you don't know the formula, you have to multiply this five times, then it becomes 2 to the power of five terms, which becomes 32 terms. And of course, all those 32 terms can be combined and be written in the form of six terms. But you, if, if you know trigonometry, you can still simplify it more and more, and then what is left at the end would be two terms. So in principle, 
this is not something that we couldn't do before. But Demoir actually discovered this very nice combination in complex numbers. If you have this particular combination and you want to raise it to some high power, even high power, even though technically you can still use binomial uh, theorem, but he discovered that we can do much, much simpler instead of using binomial theorem and simplifying at the end with a lot of effort, we don't need to do any of those things. We can just simply multiply this angle sitting in front of sine and cosine by just this number. And everybody agrees that just multiplying is much, much simpler than raising this binomial to power n. But that is just for this very specific combination. <coughs> <clears throat> okay, so because all of you have math 5, uh, at least most of you, uh, with some exceptions. So let me just prove this. Uh, the way that book has proven it is actually induction, but without naming induction, mathematical induction. Uh, but let us just use the mathematical induction to prove that. But you know that mathematical induction only works if n is a natural number. Here, I am talking about all... Uh, integer. So I'm also including negative numbers. So it means that I have to separate the proof into two distinct parts. One for natural numbers that I can apply mathematical induction directly to it. And then uh, I will use the idea here, uh, the, the, the result of this one, and then try to find, uh, try to prove the theorem for negative integers as well. Okay, so I would say that uh, let first let <coughs> n be an integer, uh, a natural number. We use mathematical induction. on n to prove this formula. Okay, so the first thing that I have to check manually is the truth for this statement for n equals to 1. So if I put n equal to 1, n equal to 1, this becomes this expression to power 1. I need to ask, is it equal to cosine, if I put 1, it becomes 1 theta, I sine 1 theta. Hopefully you agree with me that this is indeed the case. This power 1 you can eliminate, this product with 1 you can eliminate just simply write theta and then you see that this holds. So this is true. Okay. Now we assume that this is true for k, so it means that cosine theta for some in natural number k. So we assume that if I raise it to some power k, uh, assumed to be true, And then we want to show that n becomes k plus 1. For k plus 1, we want to show that this is also true. So this is the question mark again. Yes, we have to show that this one is true. Okay, but how should I do that? Okay, can you help me? I don't know if you if you haven't seen mathematical induction, don't worry, you're not losing anything. Uh, but I just want to make sure that we know how to prove this. Okay, so how should I prove this? Any one of you? No, the starting point. You don't need to see the whole thing in the beginning. Yeah take the uh, begin by the k plus one thing. Yes, and then so we begin with, uh, yeah, and then we expand it. Expand it to how? Uh, so that it becomes cosine theta k plus 
fade on and then use. Okay, so you so okay, so so first of all you need to write it down in this way. So you would say this I can write it as this two power k multiplied by one more, yes? Yes. Yes, that's correct. So and every one of you knows that if you want to raise something to power five, for example, it means that you raise it to power four and then multiply it by one more of that thing again. So if I want to raise something to power k plus one, I raise it to power k and then multiply it by one extra factor. It becomes k plus one, yes? But this one, I know what the answer is because I assume that this is, to, is true. So I can take this one and put it here. So this becomes cosine k theta plus i sine k theta. And then I multiply it by cosine theta plus i sine theta. Yes. Uh, but we already did this part, yes. So can you consider that, can I say that this is more or less like a <clears throat> polar form, yes? That's also like a polar form. So I can just multiply them. And the, the point is that if I want to multiply this combination by this combination, the argument here should be added to this argument according to the one that we have here. So here, in these cases, R1 is equal to R2 is equal to 1. And theta 1 is K theta, for example, theta 2 is theta. Yes? So I can use this formula for that. Because we have already proved and proven that I don't want to spend time. Otherwise, if you don't want to rely on that, you can just simply multiply these two things and use the addition for addition and subtraction formulas. Uh, addition formulas for sine and cosine. Okay, so I don't need to do that then. So it becomes cosine the angle, the first angle plus the second angle, sine of the same angle, yes? But then immediately you can see that here I can factor a theta out so this becomes cosine k plus 1 theta and the same thing for the sine so it becomes k plus 1 theta and you see this is exactly the right hand side okay so we were able to show that <coughs> uh, that this expression is correct for n equals to n to be a positive natural number but what about negative numbers? Okay, so I would say that now let n be a negative integer. That is, let n be negative of a natural number where m belongs to n. This is the meaning of being a negative integer. A negative integer is the negative of a natural number. So when you say that n is a negative integer, it means that it is equal to the negative of a natural number. That's the mean. yes? Okay, now let us calculate this cosine theta plus i sine theta to the power of n becomes equal to cosine theta plus i sine theta to the power of negative m. But for the power of negative m, because I want to keep the arithmetic the same, all the points was that, so I can use this fact to bring it down and then put a positive here. But if I ask you, do you know a formula for this part, you would say yes. Why? Because you see that this m is a natural number. And in the previous stage, we actually showed that Demoir's formula is correct if m is a natural number. So what can I do? I can use the Demoir formula for natural numbers now and write this as cosine m theta plus i sine m theta. Okay, <clears throat> but then what I need to do, this is not in the standard form, I have to write it in a standard form. So hopefully you remember there is a standard trick here, yes? So if I want to write it in a standard form, I need to rescale it by the conjugate of the denominator, yes?
Okay, so the numerator is 1 multiplied by that expression. So the denominator becomes the first 1 to the 2 minus the second 1 to the 2. Yes? But the second 1 to the 2, let me just write it here. So this becomes i squared sine squared m theta. But this becomes negative sine squared m theta. And this negative sign with that negative sign becomes positive. So in the numerator, I will have this. In the denominator, I will have cosine squared m theta plus sine squared m theta. But this is famous. The denominator is just 1 because sine squared plus cosine squared of the same angle is always equal to 1. But the point here is that instead of m theta, instead of cosine m theta, I would write cosine of minus m theta. Why is that? Because we know that cosine of minus alpha is equal to cosine alpha but sine of minus alpha is minus sine alpha so for the second one instead of minus sine m theta I can write positive I sine minus m theta okay but what was minus m do you see minus m is equal to n so instead of minus m here and here, I put n and n, I am done. Yeah? So it becomes cosine n theta. The denominator is just 1. I don't need to write it down. And it is exactly the same. So you see that I started with a negative integer. And I was able to show that this is also working for the negative integer. So that is the complete proof of Demoir's formula. Yes? Any questions here? So anyway, uh, be careful about that. So this formula works for po integers, positive and negative, for any value of theta that you like to, even if theta is not in the convention range. We don't need to have this for this formula to work. This formula is always true. <clears throat> any questions? Uh, okay, so what we can do now, uh, let us talk a little bit about what happens to the argument when you multiply. So what do you think? Look at this formula here. So do you think that I can write argument of z1 z2 is equal to the argument of z1 plus argument of z2 what is your opinion about this equality can I rely on this equality based on this formula here don't we have the problem that we have to Yes. Uh, well, it's possible that rxz1 and rxz2 becomes greater than exactly. Uh, pi two. Okay. Uh, so, yes, you are completely right. In the books, you see people write it like this. Uh, because of theta plus theta one plus. If I ask you what is the argument of z1, so theta one is the argument of z1. Theta 2 is the argument of Z2. So if I add them, Theta 1 plus Theta 2 becomes argument of Z1 plus argument of Z2. So this is 100% correct. And this angle appears here. But because of the convention, uh, you need to know that when you want to call it an argument, that argument by convention should be somewhere between, I don't know, 0 and 2 pi. Yes? So in that case, if you call the left-hand side argument of z1, z2, it's not totally wrong, but you need to be careful about adjusting it, fine-tuning it. 
because as Alex mentioned for example it might happen that theta 1 let us work with degree it is easier for us is for example 120 and for example let us have theta 2 to be 270 degrees both of them are acceptable they are in the appropriate interval they are in the between 0 and 360 degrees but of course if I add them together it becomes 390 degrees I cannot say that the argument of my complex number is 390 degrees because it is out of the uh, convention range but we understand what to do if the argument is 390 so I should change it with something acceptable 390 is where you just go one full round it is 360 and then you go 30 degrees more so this would be 390 degrees but on the other hand the end point corresponding to this angle is the same po end point corresponding to angle 30 so if, I'm, if I have two complex numbers with these arguments if I multiply them I can cook up a recipe I add them together if it is in the appropriate range it is acceptable if it is not in the appropriate range I will find the final point corresponding to this sum and then replace it with an, with, uh, with an angle in the appropriate range so that is the recipe so even though this formula is not 100% correct but people see it you can see this in the complex numbers book they mean exactly this some people are more exact and they write mod modulus 2 pi okay so that's also correct because for example if I want to write 390 degrees it is 1 times 360 degrees plus 30 degrees more when I write module modulus modular 2 pi or modular 360 degrees it means that any integer multiple of them I will cross them over it's exactly math 5 that's the same modular but usually uh, the modular should be an integer here they use the same idea but they write 2 pi so if you, if I write it in that way but let us uh, make it clear so if someone asks you what is the argument of z1 times z2 yes uh, you would say that this is the angle bit uh, on in the interval uh, uh, 0 to 360 degrees such that this is the angle in the interval uh, that whose end point let me write it in this way whose end point corresponds to to the angle argument of z1 plus argument of z2 yeah so it's good to understand so if someone asks you what is the argument of the product you can write it like that if it is not in the appropriate range you need to find the final point corresponding to this angle and replace it by an angle whose end point is exactly the same end point but it lies in the interval that's it so can you for example uh, tell me what happens for this one what can I write for argument of z1 divided by z2 if I want to write something for this I would say this is exactly the same this is the angle in the interval 0 if your convention is this convention whose end point corresponds to to the angle okay can you tell me which angle uh, 
instead argument of argument of yes? z1 minus argument. Exactly. Argument of z1 minus argument of z2. Exactly. Okay, can you tell me something about this? What is argument of a complex number to some power n if n is an integer? This needs the Demoir's formula actually. So what is this one? Let us let us explore this a little bit. If I go to the next page, we learn that cosine theta plus i sine theta to power n is equal to cosine n theta plus i sine n theta. Yes? So what happens if I want to raise this combination to power n. This is simple, yes? If I want to raise this combination to power n, it is clear that I need to raise the r to power n and I need to raise this to power n. But the second term is actually the Demoir's formula, so this becomes this. Okay, so let me just write this here. So if z is equal to r cosine theta plus i sine theta, and if n belongs to z, then z to power n is r to power n cosine n theta plus i sine n theta. Yes? Okay, now if I want to bring this page here, this part to this page, Let me cut it here and then put it here. Okay, so what can we write here? Uh, so what should I write in front of this question mark now? I would write, this is the angle in the range uh, between 0 degrees and 360 degrees whose end point corresponds uh, to the end point it corresponds to the angle okay can you tell me what should I write here now Argument Thank you very much, yes. N times argument of C. So you, you understand actually uh, what is going on. So, okay, let us start uh, solving some problems using these ideas. So example, So let z be equal to a square root of 3 minus i. Determine z to power 100. Okay, so if I want to calculate z to power 100, even you see in the question you don't see any track of Demoir's formula or whatever, but you see that you have a high power of z. There are some exceptions that you might be able to solve them without using the Demoir's formula. One of the famous examples that I mentioned, if I give you this to power 100, you really don't need to use Demoir's formula because of a coincidence. Because if you raise this to power 2, it becomes 1 plus 2i plus i squared, but coincidentally these two cancel and I get a monomial, and raising it to power 50 becomes simple. Except those these exceptions, Whenever you have a high power of z, you need to remind yourself of the Demoir's formula and the polar form, okay? So how should I do that? The first thing that you need to do is to rewrite this in the polar form, make it more complicated, but the benefit would be that you will be able to use the Demoir formula. So here, what I want to do, I would say that for writing this in the polar form, I need to have the absolute value of my complex number, which is defined to be square root of the real part squared 
plus the imaginary part squared and this becomes square root of 3 plus 1 square root of 4 which is 2 so r is actually 2 and then I need to de de uh, determine the argument so for the argument if you remember I told you that it's better to draw a rough diagram for yourself okay so here I have a square root of 3 so assume that the square root of 3 is somewhere here you don't need to be pre precise at all and the imaginary part is negative 1 so if that's negative 1 so that would be your vector yes that would be your vector and then you know that your argument is this okay but you can calculate alpha this is your theta which you don't know but you can calculate alpha so tangent of alpha is equal to the up the length of the opposite side this is minus one but the length is one and then divided by the length of the adjacent side which is this one so alpha becomes tangent inverse of one over square root of three if you have it in your memory you use a calculator so this becomes pi over six uh, I prefer to write it in radian it is easier for me to work with fractions than decimal points so here uh, of course yeah one, 100 pi so it is pi over 6 so let me write the number in the polar form so the number in the polar form you need to know the formula so that's this but we calculated r to be 2 so I replace r with 2 and instead of theta I just put pi over 6 yes and now I want to raise it to power 100 so what happens it becomes 2 to power 100 but the good point is that because it is in the polar form I don't need to raise it to power 100 I just simply multiply the angle by 100 and then we want to simplify as always so if I simplify that it becomes 50 pi over 3 plus i sine 50 pi over 3 okay and usually I will not leave it like that uh, of course this is not something wrong about it but if I want to be more careful might be I will express that express this in the polar form even though that's completely okay and acceptable but it is not in the polar form because this is not in the appropriate range okay so how should I put it in appropriate range so what I do I will try to make this angle I will pull out the the multiples of 2 pi out of it because these are just full around so it doesn't matter so if I want to write it I would write it in this form mm. so let me write it 48 pi because that's a multiple of 3 and then plus two more pi's and then divided by three so if I divide them separately it becomes 16 pi plus 2 pi over 3 okay so if I ask you where is the final point corresponding to this angle you have 16 pi's 16 pi's means 8 times 2 pi 2 pi is a full round so it means that I go 8 full rounds but I have an extra angle that I need to consider. This full rounds doesn't care when it comes to cosine and sine. It doesn't mean that these angles are the same. No, the angles, this angle is quite bigger than this angle. But when it comes to cosine and sine, because the final points of this angle and that angle are the same, so cosines and sines are the same. So this can be written more simplified version of that. So it becomes cosine of 2 pi over 3 plus i sine 2 pi over 3 by the way 2 pi over 3 is a famous angle yes it's 120 degrees and in principle either you have it in your memory or you can uh, determine it by your trigonometric knowledge so this becomes 2 to the power of 100 cosine of 120 is minus 1 half and sine of it is the square root of 3 over 2 and what I, if I want to write it in a standard form, I will multiply 2 to the power 100 inside. So it becomes negative 2 to the power of 99 plus 2 to the power of 99 square root of 3 and then times i. Yes, so that would be the final answer. 
So hopefully you realize that this demo formula actually very, very handy. If we didn't know that, so apparently this sim this form was much simpler. I wrote it in a more complicated form, but the benefit is that now I can use the Demoir's formula to calculate the, the harder part of it much easier. So that's the benefit of using Demoir's formula. Any questions? No. Okay. Uh, of course, the situation is not always very friendly like that, but at least if you have calculator, you can calculate. For example, let me give you another example. Uh, if you want, for example, let me just uh, choose a very simple one to see that the situation is not always the same. Okay, for example, uh, Let me ask you this question. Let z be equal to just 3 plus 4i. Determine, uh, for example, I don't know, z to power 100 again. Okay. Then you see that this, uh, even though we can use everything, but we need, if we want to find the exact value, we can write it in exact form, but in practice, if I want to calculate that, might be I need to do some approximations using the calculator at the end. So if I ask you to calculate this, you will follow the same process. So what you need to do, first of all, you need to calculate r, which is absolute value of z, which is the square root of the real part of the 2, imaginary part of the 2, so it becomes 5. So r is just 5. Then we just draw a rough diagram for ourselves. So, so the real part is 3, so let me consider this, and the imaginary part is 4. So that would be the z, and this would be the vector. In this case, the argument is exactly this angle, theta. So here we don't need to calculate alpha first. The tangent of theta is the opposite side, which is 4 units, divided by the adjacent side, which is 3. But if you put this in the calculator, this is not one of those famous angles. So you need to keep it like that if you want to write exact values. So in principle, uh, in principle, z should be we should be able to write z as r which is 5 then cosine of theta but theta is this angle so this is z and it is not that user friendly as before uh, you will learn in university how calculate this and how calculate the exact value. By the way, it is not hard. You should be also be able to do that. How can I calculate the exact value of this? You should be able to do it immediately. Everything is in front of your eyes now. Isn't it clear? No, we're here. I'm here. What? I'm here. Yes, isn't it clear? So what do you want to answer something? No, you said didn't you leave? So I said no, we're here. Ah okay, no, I, I, I said that isn't it clear? 
Uh-huh. Okay. okay. <laughs> I didn't say is aren't you here? Yeah. Now, first of all, first of all, you need to this is also good because I want to under, test your understanding. If I factor a 5 out from here, what will happen? So you have 3. So let me change my color uh, and write it something somewhere here. So if I ask you z is equal to 3 plus 4i, if you factor a 5 out, what will happen? It becomes 3 over 5 plus 4 over 5. Do you agree or not? And then you see, if you compare this one with this one, what will happen? This 5 is this 5. This i is that i here. So this means that this expression should be this number and this expression should be that number. So it's not surprising. So if I ask you what is the exact value of cosine of tangent inverse of 4 over 3, the answer is 3 over 5. And what is the exact value of sine of tangent inverse of 4 over 3? It's just 4 over 5. This is one way to do it. Another way to do it is just looking here. I am just writing these things on this side, so I should see that it is clear. If I ask you what is the whole expression that you are looking for, you are looking for cosine of this, but the name of that angle is theta, so you are looking for cosine of theta. And if I ask you what is the cosine of theta, you would say the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. So it is 3 over 5, another way to understand that. And if I ask you what is sine of this expression, you are interested in sine of theta. So it is the opposite side, which is 4 divided by the hypotenuse, which is 5. Yes? So the exact values of these two expressions we can find, but that, that is useless because if I put the exact value, it becomes 3 over 5, and this becomes 4 over 5, and then I multiply it back, I will go back to the same starting point. So you see, it's, it's useless if you want to calculate the exact value here. The point is that I want to raise it to power 100 now. According to the formula we discovered, I can just raise this one to power 100, but I have to multiply my angle by 100. This is the best you can do if you want to keep the exact values. Okay? If you want to do some approximations, then you can. For example, you can use this using the calculator multiplied by 100 and calculate cosine theta. But that is also very, very good. Because if you didn't know this formula, you were not able to find an approximate value for the z to power 100 at the end of the day. But here, at least, even though this is a very, apparently, not very friendly formula, but it is useful because now you can calculate this and using your, because it is very practical, yes? You punch this number in your calculator, press this tangent inverse button, you get a number, you multiply it by 100, and then you calculate cosine of that angle, this would be that number. And the same story here. So you finally you will get approximate value to z to power 100 by any precision that you like. If you need more precision, you need to keep more decimal points. Okay, I gave you this example to show you that this is not always a very... So most of the ex exercises on the book are using the exact values or the angles that you can calculate, things like that. But usually in practice might be you face something like this. And that's completely acceptable and okay if it happens in an engineering problem. Because you can approximate this to any uh, degree of accuracy that you desire. Uh, okay, any questions? Okay, let, let me give you one example and then we end the lesson here. Uh, let me see if I can... Yeah, I saw a good problem in there. Let me pause this video so that I can uh, go back and write something here. E, be equal to this complex number. Yeah, let me make it a little bit simpler. Just take this. 
determine the argument okay let me make it nicer uh, how can we make it nicer okay let us let us make it harder than even that one so uh, determine the polar form form of this complex number of z okay so yeah so what I have I have something like this I want to write this in the polar form do you have any suggestions I mean if we're very stupid we could uh, <laughs> try to uh, use the uh, distance formula and, uh, and then to calculate the angle but uh, a probably smarter idea would be to uh, take the smaller parts and, and get their polar forms first and then uh, use the rules we just learned to yeah even, yeah so what you said is exactly correct but I think we can do it a little bit more efficient that one you said so what you are saying is that let us turn this into polar form turn this to the polar form turn this to the polar form yes and then of course we have the demoors formula we can raise them to power 5 too easily and then try to use the formulas of multiplication and division that's completely okay and I believe that that is not that stupid you said uh, the first well, one I was idea, yeah but what is a better idea you need to remember the theorems I know that in this level those theorems are parts of the exercises and usually you don't pay attention to remember them but if I ask you for writing a number in polar form what you need you say that I need two ingredients one I need the absolute value of Z and the other one you need the argument let us focus uh, on the absolute value first absolute value can be done very easily if you remember some of the theorems that I mentioned it for you do you remember so for example can you just tell me what is probably the best way to calculate absolute value of Z here of course uh, the very hard one as you said is to raise this to power 5 to power 2 and then multiply them and then divide them and then find the real parts and imaginary parts and then use the formula this yes but do you remember I told you that the absolute value of this expression is this the absolute value of this number okay but what can I do do you remember we had some Take formula the absolute value of the denominator and the divided by the absolute number of exactly so the absolute value of Z dot W is absolute value of Z dot w, is absolute value of W if you remember the absolute value of a fraction is the absolute value of the numerator divided by the absolute value of the denominator and absolute value of any number to power n is absolute value of that number then to power n so I showed all of them to you as a, a formula, as a theorem. Okay, so we can use them. So this becomes the absolute value. Hopefully you understand what I am writing. This one to power five, absolute value of this one to power two, and then the absolute value of the denominator. So if you don't understand, please let me know. Okay, but now absolute value of this is super simple. It's just 1 squared plus 1 squared, which is the square root of 2, and then to power 5. So this becomes square root of 2 to power 5. Absolute value of this one is also easy. It is a square root of 1 plus 3. I raise this one to power 2, raise this one to power 2, it becomes 2. Uh, and then I have 2 to power 2, yes? And absolute value of the denominator is 3 plus 1 is 4 again 2. Do you agree with me? So you see, it was, it was very, very simple if you use the theorems effectively. It's very, very simple. And then uh, what is the answer? If I want to simplify my answer, so this 2 and that 2 are gone. And then this one is a square root of 5 to a square, sorry, a square root of 2 to power 4, and then multiplied by another square root of 2. So this is 4. So finally it becomes 8 square root of 2. Uh, let me double check. So I have a 2 there, and then 
for, uh, so let me let me be careful here. So square root of two to power five is square root of two to power four multiplied by square root of two. So this becomes two and two four square root of two. Yes, that's correct. So the absolute value is 8 square root of 2, definitely. But can you tell me how can I calculate the argument? We learned about the argument of this today, just right now. Let me just remind you, I want to talk about these things. You see, arguments of z to power n should be calculated in this way. Arguments of z1 dot z2 should be calculated in this way, and the same for the product. So what we do, I, what I do, I will actually follow that rule. Uh, I will take the argument of this and multiply it by 5 because it is being raised to power 5. I calculate the argument of this and multiply it by 2. And now because they have been multiplied, I add the argument of this to the argument of this. And then I calculate the argument of this, but this is dividing, so I subtract them. If it happens the final answer is in the appropriate range, I am lucky and that is my argument. If it is not in the appropriate range, I will find the end point and then corresponding to one angle in the appropriate range. Yes, it might be time consuming, but actually it's much better than doing it uh, naively, okay? So, uh, it, can you tell me what is the uh, argument of 1 plus i in your head? It's easy to imagine this one. Of course, you don't need to imagine, but it is easy, because if you draw a picture for yourself, this is 1, this is 1, so this is your vector. So what that angle is? Pi over 4. So let us write whenever we can, yes? Let us go to the other one. One, so let me take another picture. The real part is 1. The imaginary part is a square root of 3. So this is your vector. So what that angle is. So ta this tangent of theta is equal to the opposite side which is the square root of 3 divided by the adjacent side. So if you remember this angle, it is pi over 3. So the argument of 1 plus the square root of 3 times i is pi over 3. And now if I ask you what is the argument of the other number minus square root of 3 plus i, you can draw another picture for yourself. Square root of minus, so assume that this is minus the square root of 3 and this is i, so this would be this angle. This is your theta, but you need to find alpha first. So tangent of alpha is the opposite side, which is 1 divided by the adjacent side uh, minus square root of, uh, sorry, square root of 3. So alpha becomes pi over 6. But what is theta? Theta is pi minus pi over 6. Um, what is that one? It is 5 pi over 6. So this is 5 pi over 6. Yeah, let us make sure that we are doing everything right. So the first two I'm completely sure. For the second one, let me double check. Minus the square root of 3 uh, is the on the x-axis and 1 tangent of alpha is opposite 1 divided by that. Yes, that's correct. Okay, now can you tell me uh, how should I proceed? I want to see that if you understood what I said before. So now I know these numbers. So how should I go for finding the argument of the whole expression? First, I need to calculate something. What is that something? How should I combine these numbers so that I get close to the argument of this? argument of 1 plus square root of 3 times i minus argument of minus square root of 3. Times Thank you very much. Is that understandable for, every, for everyone? We're just raising to power, so the argument is being multiplied. 
the argument here is being multiplied. Here I am multiplying, the arguments are being added, and then I am dividing, so I have to subtract. But this is, of course, might be this is not in the range. If it happens to be in the range, that's it. If it is not in the range, I need to adjust it. So this is why I don't write something here. So let me just blindly calculate that. So it becomes 5 pi over 4 plus 2 pi over 6, over 3 minus 5 pi over 6. The, uh, the common denominator would be 12. So 15 pi, uh, 8 pi, and 10 pi. So what's the answer? 13 pi over 12. By the way, is it in the appropriate range or not? Yes or no? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah, it is. So we were lucky. Uh, I didn't mean to be very lucky, but we are actually. So this is in the appropriate range. It is between 0 and 2 pi. It might happen that this is a number greater than 2 pi, or it might be it's a negative number, but then you need to find the final point corresponding to that and replace it by the 1 in the appropriate range. Now, what was the question? The question was to determine the polar form of Z. Now we are done. So Z becomes equal to... What was the... R, R was this number, and then I would write it in this form. And that is the answer to this uh, problem. Okay, any questions?